There's a famous poem in Thailand about the amorous adventures of two men, basically trying to outdo each other in the number of women they can sleep with. One of the most interesting passages, though, is when one of the men is entering in the apartments of this one woman. And he opens the door, and there's a screen. And the screen is painted with a story. And then the poem drops the story of the man and the woman and goes into the story in the screen, describing not only the events, but also how they're depicted on the screen. It turns out the woman herself painted the screen. And so the man goes from panel to panel. Not only does he see the story, but he also gets a very good sense of what kind of person she is, by the way she handled the scenes, how she painted the characters. So even though you haven't met her yet in the poem, by the time you finish the story on the screen you know her through her handiwork. This is a principle you find throughout Thai culture. Back in the old days, people would learn about each other by the way they did things, the things they made. If you were a young man and wanted to uh, appeal to a young woman, you would carve a pole for her to carry over her shoulder when she was, car for, when she was going to carry things to the monastery. And she'd get a very good sense of what kind of person you were by the kind of pole that you carved. And most of us would be hopeless in a situation like that. We're not used to making things. This is one of our problems as meditators. We don't have many physical skills, and we haven't learned the mental qualities that go with developing a physical skill. And so I've got to go back and learn them from scratch. This is why the training is not just sitting and walking, but it's a whole lifetime. All the things you do throughout the day are opportunities to develop mindfulness, alertness, learning how to be meticulous in what you do. And John Lee has a whole Dharma talk on cleanliness. The title of the talk is reflection on virtue, or recollection of virtue. But a good two-thirds of the talk is about being clean. That's an important part of virtue. In other words, while you're living here, don't think that the day-to-day -day facts of eating, having a place to sleep, are things just to get through so you can get to the real business of meditating. If you're sloppy with things outside, you're going to be sloppy with your meditation. It's a basic principle. You want to learn how to be meticulous, clean, neat, alert in all the things you do. And that way the activities become not a chore to be gotten through or something just getting in the way of your meditation. It becomes part of the meditation. After all, the word meditation is bhavana, means to develop. You're developing qualities of mind. And the same mind that cleans your room is going to be the same mind that tries to clean itself out. And if it's sloppy in cleaning the room, it's going to be sloppy in cleaning itself out. So you've got to take this seriously. Remember John Fuhrman telling me about his time with a John Munn, how a John Munn was extremely meticulous and very clean about everything. Even living out in the forest in the dry season when there was a lot of dust. His hut, everything around that was very neat, very clean. Everything was in its right place. Even the rags that he used to wipe off his feet, he always kept them well washed. If they got torn, he would sew them up. He didn't let anything go to waste. So try to have this attitude in all your activities. When you're training the mind, the mind is not only there when you meditate. It's the same mind that 
goes through the day, what you do, what you say, how you do your chores. There are qualities of mind that are being shown that way. And they're also being developed. I mean, if you're developing sloppy, lazy habits in your day-to-day -day chores, those habits are going to get in the way of your meditation. If you learn to be meticulous, neat, those habits will come and help your meditation. Because the mind is like a large tree. You have some trees that have only one shoot at the end, like a banana tree. It grows very fast, but it doesn't give much shade. The trees that give a lot of shade are the ones that have that grow lots of branches. So there's a lot to be covered in training the mind. It's not just mastering one single technique. I was once asked the question, how does someone who's mastered meditation overcome the, the problem of pride? After all, you've been able to master this technique, you're pretty sharp. Well, that happens mainly in places where everything is just reduced to a meditation technique, and it becomes a meditation center. And the people who meditate don't have to do anything else. Everything gets channeled into that one shoot at the end. And so things may happen fast, but there's no shade. It's an incomplete training. The complete training has to go all around. It has to deal with the way you deal with other people, how you handle difficult situations. Your whole life is part of the training. And in course of that aspect of the training, you're going to have to learn how to basically see how you've been sloppy, how you've been stupid, how you've been ignorant, how you've been thoughtless and careless. If you don't see that, you're not going to learn anything. And that experience is chastening. So that when the training is complete, every aspect of the mind has been trained. So that you're skilled in all kinds of activities. One time in my very first year with the John Fuang, the time came for the, the Katin which is the big event of the year. There are lots of people who are going to come from Bangkok. They're going to have to be housed. Some of them had to be housed overnight for a night or two before they get in. And everybody was going to have to be fed. And I had a dream one night that a John Fung had this huge closet with lots of different hats. And he would go in, he'd put, put on one hat and come out, and then come go back in, put on another hat, come out with a different hat. And sure enough, as in the preparation for the get in, they had to put up bamboo sheds, and they had to, he had to arrange for the extra kitchen areas, a lot of different tasks. And he was good at them all. And as he told me, practicing the Dharma is not just being good at sitting with your eyes closed. It involves learning how to be skillful in everything you do. This attitude that wants to be skillful, that's the attitude that's going to see you through lots of different problems. And if you don't give a damn about things outside, well, your mind is going to be that kind of don't give a damn kind of mind. It gets apathetic, careless. But if you make up your mind that whatever chore falls to, you're going to try to do skillfully. You develop what are called the four bases for success, the desire to do it skillfully. Then you stick with it until you've, got, you've mastered it. You have to be intent, pay a lot of attention to what you're doing. Then, then use your powers of analysis to see what's not right yet, and try to figure out how to get away, get around problems, how to solve them. It requires ingenuity, all the active activities of the mind. In the text, they talk about these qualities specifically dealing with concentration, but it's a common teaching all over Thailand that you want to succeed in anything, you have got to develop these qualities of mind. And in whatever area you develop them, though, you can take those qualities of mind and you can apply them to other areas of, as well. So 
to see every aspect of your life as an opportunity to train the mind. If you want to develop good, strong powers of concentration, it's not just what you do while you're sitting with your eyes closed. It's how you tackle any activity, learning how to be focused on that activity. Learning to be strict with the mind when it starts wandering off. That way the mind is right there. You learn how to keep it right there no matter what you're doing. Then when the time comes to sit down with your eyes closed, well, you're right there. You don't have to go chasing the mind down. So try to see the practice as a seamless whole. The word in Bhavana, as I said, is to develop. You can develop your mind in any situation. You don't think it's only when you're sitting with your eyes closed that the important insights are going to come. There are many references to this in the canon. There was one nun who, whose mind finally came to good solid concentration while she was washing her feet. And the poem is interesting because after she washes her feet, then she goes into the bed, into the, into her hut, and does all the things you're told to do in the vineyard. She checks the bed first before she sits down on it, and then she takes a pin and she pulls the wick out of the lamp. And as soon as the fire went out, she said that was the moment of her awakening. She said like the liberation of awareness was like the liberation of the fire. It's not only while you're sitting with your eyes closed that important things can occur to the mind, important insights can come, or that the mind can gather. It's amazing. Sometimes the mind can really get concentrated while you're just doing a chore. If you approach the chore with a proper respect. So remember, this tree of ours has lots of branches. They're all growing at once. It may be slow because they're all growing at once, but at least you get a, a tree with, that offers really good shade once it's grown. That's what it means for the mind to be well trained, all trained all around. You see the mind in its activities, so you want to make sure that it's well trained in all its activities.